John Ron on Twitter and everywhere else that, that is important. Um, just a brief, who am I? I like Ruby uh, a lot, obviously, that's why I'm here. Um, I love beer. I gave a really good demonstration of this last night. Uh, anyone that wasn't there, there's going to be a repeat performance tonight. Uh, where, where is it, Rick? Do you know the, uh, the name of the place? Okay. Well, wherever he goes, I'm going to drink beer. BBC. BBC. Uh, I've made a few things. So, um, if anyone's ever used Ice Cube, which is a, a data occurrence library or uh, Easy Translate, these are a couple things that I've made. Uh, I'm sure you can find other things that I've made also. And I work at Patch in New York, so just a quick shout out for my employer, because um, I said I would, and I came all the way from New York. Um, if you live in New York or want to live in New York and you're a Ruby developer, uh, come find me. We do really interesting things. We're able to freely contribute to open source uh, as ourselves, which is really cool. That's a, a nice benefit, um, which I know a lot of you have, but a lot of you also don't. So the plan for today. First, we're going to talk about do what. So we're going to talk about what do I mean when I say splitting your app. Then we're going to talk about why you would want to do that. Then we're going to talk about how you can make it happen. And then we're going to talk about when the best time to make a shift like the one I'm about to describe uh, should fit into your plan. Where's that little iPad thing? Okay, there's, there's plenty of time. Okay. <laughs> Do I have time? Uh, okay. So I'm actually talking about a few things when I talk about splitting your app. And it might not be apparent, but the first thing I'm talking about is, is services. So I'm talking about taking your app and breaking it into multiple pieces so that you can um, hopefully get the benefits that are tied to services talk about in a second. But the second thing that I'm also talking about is APIs. So as we're splitting the app into pieces, there's no reason that the pieces that we split out can't serve as APIs themselves. And this API might be a public-facing API, or it might be just something you can't uh, around internally or to other parts of your business. Um, but there's no reason that when we break off into a service, we can't have a, a, a nice API to work with. So why do you care? Uh, the correlation between scaling and splitting your app is, is very, very high. Uh, just imagine trying, trying to lift something, right? And it's very tightly coupled, and it, and it goes um, really big across. And you, you try to lift it up, and you try to make it bigger. Uh, but it's so heavy, and it's so uh, cumbersome, because it's this huge piece. Uh, a lot of times, it, it's valuable. We see this like, uh, who, everyone in this room probably, has uh, multiple database machines, uh, maybe a single uh, a single application, uh, right? Is that fair? So splitting your app at that level, but we also have to be uh, thinking about splitting our app at the application level. So taking the uh, maybe the model side of our application or the controller side of our application and finding ways to scale that separate of the rest. This is not something we really think about until it becomes a problem. Uh, and it recently did at Patch when we went from 30 accounts to 850 accounts in three months. So. Uh, the amount of users that we had just, just blew up when we did that. So this is the age of innocence. Uh, this is the first thing that you do when you want to expose some kind of an API or have some kind of service. Maybe, uh, maybe it's even just JavaScript on your own application calling back. Uh, you just add response to to your controller. You respond to different things. You respond to JSON. You respond to XML. And you start doing this in a whole bunch of different places. And respond to. Uh, it is very innocent in the sense that you're every time you add a uh, respond to, you're coupling that controller action and the data that it's going to give back. And if it needs to change independently of your application, you can't do that. Also, you're adding these response to blocks kind of just where they're needed, and it's not maintainable. So the next thing you do is just the age of denial. Uh, you decide to make a folder inside the controllers called uh, API, and you make other controllers that do the same thing as your normal controllers but they only are there to respond to API requests. So they only return, uh, they only do response to. Or maybe you decide to use something uh, like great. Then uh, relief comes when you decide that you're going to take uh, the logic in your API and split it out to a separate application. But at this point, things were getting too big. So you said, hell, if I just make a new application, that'll be super fast. Maybe your relief has class. Uh, so it's built in Sinatra, or it's built in Great. I had to put that image in there because that's the coolest thing about Sinatra. 
That image is awesome. Um, so how can we do this? How can we avoid duplicating logic, which is the, uh, the problem with making that new application is that uh, if you have all of this logic on your model layer, all this logic inside your controllers, you end up copying all that logic forward into the API layer. Then if a business rule changes, you need to change it in two places instead of one. How can we write less code that does more, which should just be um, when it makes sense and when it's still readable should be a goal that we strive for all the time. And how can we not all build the same thing? Meaning everyone in this room not all build the same thing. So I'm going to describe a couple of tools that I've been working on um, and that we've been using in patch with uh, a lot of success. So the first one is called Flexible API. The second one is called Flexible API Server. And the third one is called Constructor RB. So first I'm going to talk about Flexible API. So you include Flexible API uh, into a model. And by doing that, you get a method um, to hash. So to hash does the same thing that you would get out of something like attributes. And it doesn't seem very useful, um, just like this. And it's really not, because it's, it's just attributes, right? So um, what we realized really quickly was that there were multiple people that wanted the same data from us. They wanted it slightly different, in slightly different formats. Um, and they wanted to make the requests in slightly different ways. So for example, uh, we recently did an integration with the Huffington Post. And the Huffington Post, on their page, they want to make a request. And they wanted to basically say, give me the most popular story in the past 48 hours from this latitude and longitude. Uh, but at the same time, we're building a mobile app. It's going to be out at the end of March. And the mobile app is also using the exact same API. And when they call about a story at a lot long, they want a list of the publications around that lot long also. So it doesn't make sense to have to give that back to all the users that are calling in from the Huffington Post. So we invented this idea of uh, request levels. So request levels basically say, what are the things at this request level that we care about? Uh, so in, in this simple case, um, we can just list a bunch of fields. These can either be methods or these can be um, actual fields. They're just calls to the, to the model instance. And when we call to hash, we're able to pass in a symbol which represents the request level at which uh, we want the hash back. So this hash doesn't have ID in it because the request level doesn't have ID in it. Request levels can also have notations. So you can make notations and, and pass a block that basically says, um, for this request level, I want to do something uh, special. And I, I don't want to make a new method for it because it's something, something small. It's just a notation. You can use this to uh, return the time along with things or do stupid things like this. Uh, and then the hash contains the notation also. Then it gets really interesting because you can also do includes. So you can say, this request level includes this association uh, with optional scoping. So you can say, uh, if you wanted the most recent articles to be included inside of every publication that you give back to a user, the request level can have an include that gives the most recent articles um, and you can actually do the include there at a certain request level. So when you call to hash with uh, this nesting request level, you get a nested hash path, which has a person inside of it. So this is all kind of stupid. Uh, it's just a hash builder, right? It's just a, a really fancy way, uh, a nice DSL for building hashes of any given model. When it gets really interesting, it's here. So find hash and find all hash. And the reason that this is really interesting is that when the model hasn't been loaded yet, when the instance of the model hasn't been loaded yet, the find hash will actually do a select um, when it goes to get the record. So it's only going to pull back the actual fields that are inside the request level. And find all hash will actually preload all the associations forward. So you, have, you, you get to stop worrying about, um, about whether or not um, you stop having to write all of these includes and you start just worrying about what's going to be returned to the user. So then uh, there's a partner for it. It's Flexible API Server. And the idea behind Flexible API Server is that we want to be able to quickly roll out an API that's entirely usable. And the way that it works is like this. So Flexible API Server is a small Sinatra server that sits on top of a group of models that uh, include Flexible API. And it gives you paths like this. So you can get things, get things by ID, or get things by ID with a certain relation. Uh, and these return in either JSON format or XML format, depending on your accept header. By default, it's a 
JSON. And they will return at the request level that the user is associated with. So you also get for free things like limit, offset, and also things like if you prefer this magic uh, page and per page, you can use that instead. You also get count only equals true, which will just return a count instead of returning the records. You also get all of these. Um, so put things to update an object with all of um, the data in put and put params to create a new object or to create a new object through a relation uh, for has many and has many throughs. So let your mind wander. Uh, this also does other things like deletes. I didn't want to put on the slide because it's scary, but I'll say it out loud. Uh, it also does deletes, so you can do uh, delete slash things, and that'll actually perform destroy all on all the things. Um, also, at the base of the entire thing, since this is sitting on top of a database and it knows exactly what it's doing, uh, we're able to provide documentation that's built on the fly that just details what's inside of individual request levels on individual models. Um, also, since it's in the database, we can provide example URLs that actually point to resources that the user could uh, could access. So the way that we could do that, uh, we do slash things, uh, we do thing.find, uh, whatever the scope is, and then just do dot first and use that inside of the example. So it's not pretty, but better documentation. Um, and you can, it, you can also put an optional um, locale files alongside it that describe what individual fields are for the user. So like you'd say people.id is a certain thing or, or name is a certain thing. So then constructor RB is this way to get back a list of all of the things. Uh, this is something that you would use in the other half of your application uh, to interact with the API from Ruby. And the way that it's typically used is like this. And this is the way that we use it in our application. So instead of inheriting, uh, Imagine your application being two pieces, where one piece is kind of the front end, back end, and the other piece is the back end, back end. So back end, back end deals with the data, that's where the API would be running, and the front end, back end deals with um, hand, uh, handling the controller actions and making calls back across the API. So this is a way to, instead of inheriting from active record base, inherit from construct base. Um, and when you make calls, the, the DSL mimics active record DSL, so when you make calls, they're actually happening across the API boundary, but they look like they're happening locally. So what we were able to do with this, um, there's a few models in our application that we were able to completely swap out with absolutely no changes to our code, and uh, our application is making calls across the API boundary using construct. The other cool thing about construct is that it's just construct RB, so we also have construct JS, and we also have construct objective C. So our application developers on the iPhone are writing calls in construct Objective-C. Um, so when we add new API calls, they don't need to write new code to, to parse the JSON or figure out how to deal with it. They can just use it. Um, you also get things like reload, so you can reload at a certain request level. So at Patch, um, what we ended up doing is we made a completely separate app that, that runs this, and we use construct RB inside of our application and slowly are moving things um, to the services model using construct RB in our application. We also use git submodules. And the way that we use git submodules is we actually submodule our existing app inside of the API. And then what we do is we load the entire model and uh, vendor layer. So we have access to everything that was in our existing models. And our API can use all the business logic. And when something changes, it automatically changes in our API. Um, but we don't, have to, we don't have to rewrite or maintain two applications at the same time. We just maintain the API layer. Uh, currently, and this is actually in production right now, um, our mobile developers are using this. So we have an iPhone and Android platform that are both using this. Uh, we have external consumers, uh, external inside of AOL, which is our parent company, know, AOL, uh, and also external to the world. And also, um, we have certain places where the JavaScript on our site, since the API and the application are sharing uh, a cookie, the JavaScript on our site is actually making calls to the API instead of our application. Uh, and this is all happening right now, live. Um, so a couple issues that you might run into with something like this. Uh, one is rate limiting. Um, 
So what we ended up doing with rate limiting is we use uh, we use Buildware to handle the problem because it's just it's just rat, right? So basically, um, if you make too many requests in a certain period of time, you just throttle. Uh, we also um, I think our ops team actually added uh, rate limiting in Apache because we were on passenger. Um, I don't know why we need both. Uh, authentication is another issue. So the idea with authentication with uh, with Flexible API is that users are tied to request levels, and everything that they do is is tied to what can this user see and what can they update, and that's all contained inside of a request level. So when a user views slash things and they are of a certain type, they have a default request level that, that will be associated with them. Uh, and that also uh, enforces itself on posts and puts. So if they try to update attributes that aren't inside of the request level that they have access to, they'll get turned away. So uh, wrapping up, this is just wrapping up. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, obviously there's value in splitting your application, but I think that finding ways, finding ways to do it with the least pain, uh, that are still somewhat elegant, is, is really valuable. And I think that, that that's, um, that's what we've done. I'm excited to hear uh, any questions or feedback that anyone has on any of this. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that we do, um, oh yeah. So the, the question was, um, what if you want to limit access to certain um, certain like types of, of record and not just the fields inside of the records, right? Um, so what we do for that is actually you can in inherit a flexible API server and extend it, right? So when we go to extend it, the paths where we want to enforce uh, additional logic, additional essentially controller logic, like like what you said. Um, we have a method called pass that allows us to say, like, do this thing and then pass, and it will pass up into Flexible API server. So that, that's how we handle that. Um, this is, uh, just to give some background, a little bit more background on Flexible API and Flexible API server. They started actually as a separate project, much like Stratocaster did. Um, they started off kind of internally, like started building this thing, and then we realized that it had value outside, so it, it um, what you're seeing now is, I guess, the result of us running into issues like the one you said and trying to find ways um, to fix them. And there's going to be uh, a lot more work um, on this, and on especially the authentication layer. Um, I'm also speaking at, uh, at RailsConf on a similar topic. So hopefully between now and then, we'll get to somewhere where it's more useful. Yeah. Can, can you repeat what you said about the submodules? I missed part of that one. Yeah, so at Patch we use we use Git submodules, um, and the idea there is that we submodule our existing application inside of the API. So the idea is that when the API starts, we load just the model, lib, and vendor layers, and all of the initializers inside of our application. So we have access to all the models that were pre-existing, okay. and then we just go through and we define request levels on the models that exist. Um, you mean aside from some modules? We so it started out really naively by just copying things over, trying to get more of the API working, um, and you quickly realize that that's just completely not maintainable. Um, another thing that we we did early on was we used path, so we were able to actually just point over to our application. Uh, but that's assuming that you have like your application checked out alongside. And I just think submodules, I think it's a great use case for submodules. How would you handle <coughs> versioning your API or something like that? Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, versioning is definitely important. And I think that the, the approach that Grape takes with uh, just the, the version command, uh, adding a namespace to the entire thing would totally work. Actually, um, it might be valuable to consider squishing the Grape instead of Sinatra, because it's closer. Uh, other questions? So if you were to take that approach, how would you maintain multiple versions of the API running simultaneously if you run multiple copies of the app? Would you, what would it, what would your sense of how are you taking this? Um, so uh, the question is, is um, 
would I run multiple copies of the app to maintain multiple versions at the same time? So it's a good question. Um, and the way, the way that this, uh, the API, the reason that we, we started doing this, is I also built a site, um, citiesbest.com. I built the entire back end of Cities Best. Uh, it's not Rails, unfortunately. But um, the cool thing about Cities Best, and it's not a very pretty site, the cool thing about Cities Best is that everything on the page is driven by an API that sits alongside Cities Best. So all of the calls that you're seeing are actually being made um, behind the scenes to a separate API. That, I mean, it's the same kind of model that we're using here. And what we ended up doing there was we would um, we'd use routes to, to namespace all of the actions, and then you're writing tests the entire time, right? So when you make when you make a new one, you initially uh, it depends if the the it's a completely different version or not. But a lot of times you're just doing incremental updates, and in that case, what you can do is point two versions kind of at the same code, and then as they as they diverge, um, move them off. I'm not sure if that's the best approach. That's a great question. So the question is, um, the question is, how am I handling error error cases, especially uh, validations, right? Um, so what I do for validations um, right now, if you, if you try to put or post something and it's not valid, the validation happens happens inside the model layer uh, on the back end back end, so the API side. Uh, so they're just active record uh, validations, and what you'll get if you do a post that contains invalid data, you get a 422 back with an errors hash. So this is the exact errors hash off of the item that you're trying to create. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, um, just to follow up to the, uh, the question about versioning. As you've been splitting up any parts of the application into different APIs, so are the APIs in parts of your team and being handled by the different parts of our API hash? Does the problem of versioning also become a problem of you have people who aren't communicating with each other? Yeah, so the question is, um, people working on multiple parts of the application not communicating well with each other, does that, uh, does that lead into issues, um, I guess, confusion? Is that right? Or just things breaking. Or just things breaking in general. So um, we're lucky enough as we go to, um, we have a really good test coverage on the stuff that we are writing. So the API, as we're building it, and this is another benefit, is that if you split out the model layer of your application into an API like this, uh, you can essentially unit test the API. Like you're testing, um, it's like an integration test all the way through, um, the whole way, using weave wrap test to do that. Um, we're maintaining a test coverage, but we have run into issues definitely where people didn't realize that a request level already existed for a certain purpose and ended up recreating it. So I think that um, it does lend, it's, like, it's, it's hard to avoid duplication. Um, and you need to, I guess, be watching out for that. Questions? Yeah. You very briefly touched on how you had uh, created the API for your iOS calls. Yep. Did you generate that code, uh, Objective-C code? Is it as fast? I oh, that. okay. How so uh, the same way that there's this construct base, uh, constructor RB for Ruby, we have a very similar one, constructor Objective-C for Objective-C. That does the exact, what? How does that exactly oh, query yeah. the API itself, or it does. Generate it? So the way that the way that this works, um, you say set type uh, type name people. Actually, that line's not needed, but because the default is just uh, singularized underscore lowercase. So when you're when you're making calls across this, it looks like active record, but it's actually making calls completely across the API boundary, and it even works for nesting things. Like if you were to do uh, person dot things. It's going to make the call slash person slash ID slash things, uh, and then it'll unwrap the entire result and instantiate a thing object for each of the things inside the array. Uh, so it uses method missing and dynamically is generating methods as they're as they're used on these. Um, so it's kind of introspecting on the format yeah. the API. Yeah, and it actually um, the API if you're using it with constructor, uh, this is kind of a detail that I, I glossed over, like you said, but uh, returns other information of about associations that you wouldn't be able to figure out. So it'll say like, um, this article's array that I'm giving you, 
is an array of articles. And like this recent underscore articles is an array of articles. So that um, construct can pull it back and decide what kind of object to instantiate uh, for every record that it sees. That's being done dynamically. It's all being done dynamically. Uh, how do you specify where um, where it's looking for the API? If you're running them on different servers, or maybe even we're running two different um, two different uh, of uh, servers, mm -hmm. uh, how would you how would you deal with that? So we don't handle the case currently where construct uh, construct RB has to handle uh, models that exist on separate APIs. Although that's a really okay. good use case because you, you might want to uh, fragment. Right. right. Um, you might want to load only a piece of your application that does a certain thing. So that, like, if you have a gem that uh, maybe takes up a lot of memory or is like, this huge burden uh, and is only needed in a piece of your application, you can completely separate that. Um, and the way that, uh, so we don't have an answer for that, but the answer seems pretty straightforward. Um, like the answer, that I would, the fix that I would put in seems pretty straightforward. Uh, but we, what we do have an answer for it is telling them where the API is, and it just happens inside of an initializer. Okay. on the front end of your back end. So uh, the, the controller side of your application basically just says uh, construct base dot, um, dot, there's like a, I don't remember the exact name. Yeah, right, right, okay. To say where the server is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, talk to you all later.